the topic of my presentation is, is, is a new subject for me, so uh, is uh, uh, the behavior of the international market or some important national, national markets for, for art and the connection of uh, the art sector with uh, macroeconomic cycles and macroeconomic volatility on one hand, and the connection also with uh, inequality, uh, particularly inequality of wealth. Since this is a seminar series on inequality and something, this, uh, you can say that this is inequality and the art market. There is, there is, the, there is a paper that, that uh, uh, Conchita has, so it's, uh, please feel free to ask her if you want a, a copy of it, that's uh, uh, the base for this uh, presentation. Well, the, uh, a few words on, on what we do mean by the art market. Uh, well, the art market includes uh, paintings, sculptures, prints, photographs, uh, artifacts, uh, etc. So it's not only paintings. In general, we tend to identify the art market with painting, but it's a little bit uh, wider than that. This is a, it's a market that is increasing in, in size and increasing in activity. Uh, the number for 2018 uh, is that uh, the market traded um, $67 billion, up from around uh, 50 uh, billion, these are US dollars, uh, uh, 10 years ago. Um, it's a, it's a, the, the, the num if you want, there is a, a recent uh, publication called The Art Market 2019, uh, sponsored by, by UBS, the Swiss Bank, and Art Basel, uh, that uh, provides a lot of statistical information on the size of the market in the last uh, 10 years, if you want to get some uh, statistics on this. Well, this is a market that is geographically concentrated, I, I would say, in three countries. Uh, the US, that amounts for near half of the market in terms of uh, uh, value of sales, uh, followed last year by the United Kingdom uh, art market, that accounted a little bit over 20%, and then by the Chinese market, that uh, amounted to 19%. Uh, the year before, uh, 2017, the Chinese market was second after the US market. This, there is a very impressive uh, increase in the size of the Chinese market that includes also Hong Kong. Um, that uh, the overcame the, uh, surpassed by far the Japanese market. And the, the Asian market was dominated by, by Japan up to the 1990s, early 2000s, and then was uh, were turned by, by China. Uh, the, the, the three markets uh, represent around 80% of the total sales in, this, in, in the sector. Uh, in my... Uh, well, art is... Uh, I am an economist, so you have to excuse my biases, but uh, try to... Uh, but art uh, 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 is uh, not only... I mean, it's... Uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an object of aesthetic enjoyment and also an investment asset uh, has a financial dimension that I want to explore a little bit uh, in this presentation. Um, I will focus on three issues in this. Let me, well, let me, as, a, as, a, as an introduction here, I think it's, it's good to show. Well, uh, prices can be really extravagant here in this market and show this is, there is a lot of money around this sector and that's a reflection indirectly of the concentration of wealth at the top because these are very uh, wealthy people that buy uh, this uh, artwork. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the Christie's uh, house in, in New York uh, auctioned a Monet, this Monet de Heistack, in uh, $110 million dollars. They had uh, auctioned the same uh, piece in 1987 by two and a half million dollars. So the price increased 44 times over a little bit 30 years. So it's uh, 
this can be an extremely profitable investment, but you need money to, to, to exercise it. Uh, then the, the recorded uh, registered record is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundo, the, the Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world, that was sold uh, in December of 2017 by 450 million dollars. It was uh, uh, bought by a Saudi prince uh, to be handed over to the um, Louvre Abu Dhabi Museum. They, they created the collaboration. Uh, well, there are some press reports that the, the painting is lost now. Nobody knows where, where it is. I mean, it's, it clearly it hasn't reached the museum. So, but they pay the money, but... Uh, uh, and, the, and, and there is a third, just to open, is uh, Jeff Koons, which is a living artist. Uh, so uh, this, uh, Jeff Koons, by the way, is not the gentleman next to the, this is the security guard, but uh, uh, is, uh, he's, sorry, this sculpture uh, by $91 million. So these extravagant prices are not only for dead painters, but also for living painters. So. And, and galleries and, and auction houses charge uh, a fee for this transaction can, that can be very high. So there is a whole sector here. Well, let me present the, the themes of uh, the empirical part of the, of the presentation. Well, first I will uh, discuss some main features of the art market in terms of uh, market structures and connection with cycles, etc. Then I will uh, relate uh, the behavior of art prices to macroeconomic cycles and occasional market crashes in the last 20 uh, years and compare art with stocks, gold, and even bitcoins, which is a fashionable new asset around with a very interesting price structure. Uh, and then I will concentrate or will offer some uh, uh, remarks on the relationship between wealth inequality and the art uh, market. Um, well, let me start with the, with the seven features of the art market. Well, they deal with, with uh, transaction cost and liquidity, privatization, financialization of the market, concentration, polarization, sensitivity to cycles, the whole issue of, of, of uh, to what extent art, uh, people dealing with art, try to to escape uh, taxes. I mean, it's, it's a vehicle for tax evasion, occasionally also for money laundering. I was talking in Geneva before coming here with a Canadian expert on international taxation, and he told me, well, governments really don't care too much in going after people trading in art to pay more taxes. It's too expensive. I mean, uh, too expensive to enforce tax collection in this sector. So that's why it's a sort of safe haven. Well, um, the other thing is, well, I already mentioned what are the main players internationally in, the, in terms of countries in this sector and the, the concentration of wealth at the top. A few words on transaction costs and liquidity. Well, the first thing that you have to notice is that it's a market that is very difficult to uh, standardize products. Each object is unique, they are heterogeneous, so it's not easy to to have economies of scale in the trading in this sector. It's not like a, you create a bank product, let's say a saving account or a, or, or a bond or, or whatever, and you can replicate the, the, the assets and, and, and create a structure and then sell it, sell it. Here, it's more complicated. Also, it's not easy to find, find uh, buyers, uh, particularly at, at, the, at the very high prices not impossible, but it's, uh, it's not that easy. Also, uh, issues of forgery and provenance are also important. You have to check, verify the, the origin of a piece, and that costs money, uh, and therefore the transaction cost can be somewhat uh, significant. Uh, also, market pieces have infre infrequent uh, sales. You don't sell, I mean, this, this case of the Monet, it was uh, the transaction, it took uh, more than three decades for, the, for a new transaction to take place. So it's not something that uh, is an everyday market, like you go and buy 
uh, oranges or, or apples in, in, your, in your local market. So the, all, all this makes transaction costs non-trivial in this sector, okay? Informational issues, transaction, etc. And also liquidity uh, is, a, is also a potential problem. It's not that easy to convert a piece of art into money, for example, if, if you have restrictions for the sales and also if, to find buyers, etc. So liquidity is, a, is an issue here. Well, the other, the other thing that I will go very quickly with this is the, the market is, well, it's almost a tautology saying the market is privatized. The sector is becoming more uh, privatized than in the past, in the sense that, uh, that public money and governments are somewhat in some countries and some important countries withdrawing from support and relying more in support from the private sector to museums and art galleries, etc. So the, the, the private sector is taking a dominance in this, uh, in this area. And also it's a market that is increasingly financialized. When I use the, the word, put the, the word financialized, it always rejects me that like it's not in the dictionary, but economists use it. Uh, I'm not sure whether it is. But it, it, it's a sector where the, finan where the, fi the, uh, the financial uh, intermediaries like uh, hedge funds, commercial banks, uh, family offices are increasingly interested. They are creating departments to, to study the sector uh, because uh, the value of transaction is, is very attractive to them and also is uh, becoming a, a, an asset class, uh, uh, asset besides an object of enjoyment. Uh, uh, well, Empiric, the, the empirical studies tend to show that, that the, on average, in the long run, the rate of return of investing in art is not that difficult, different from investing in, let's say, stocks and bonds. This is the, very, the cherished efficient market uh, theory that, that uh, in equilibrium you may not have uh, a, a persistent tendency for one asset to dominate the other. Well, there is a one source of information for that was the, the Keynes collection study. It's, this is after, it's the collection that John Maynard Keynes, the, the famous British economist, uh, collected uh, during his lifetime. Uh, he started to buy very cheaply uh, impression, impressionist and post-impressionist in, in Paris when he, when he went as a member of the British delegation to the Peace Conference in Versailles. And so, but since it was uh, after the war, the prices were very depressed and uh, he made a good collection and then he kept buying and buying. And uh, uh, he's in uh, Cambridge University, in King's College, they have, they have the collection. But, and then Keynes was a, a very detailed uh, note taker and so he, he uh, devoted time to, to, to record the, the buying price. Uh, provide detailed description of the uh, piece of art, etc. So it's a it's a very good source of information. Well, let me let me discuss or show these numbers. On another, I think this is a very important feature of this market is the <coughs> concentration at the top and the polarization of the market. Uh, basically, if we uh, consider the lower end compared with the middle market and the high end. Uh, this is based, on, again, on this report. Claire McAndrew is a lady that formed Art Economics and coordinated this report. Uh, she's an economist. Uh, and the numbers show that uh, for pieces below $50,000, uh, the, 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 the galleries and no, not really auction houses because they are more engaging, higher price, but the galleries uh, uh, amount represent 8.6 percent of total value, but near 90 percent of the transactions. If you jump to the high end uh, pieces that are sold over one million dollars, you see that they represent 63.5 percent of the market, but roughly just one percent of the number of transactions. So the market is concentrated at the top in terms of values, but not in terms of number of uh, objects, art objects traded there. Okay. 
And so, and then there is a middle market in, in between for pieces between $50,000 and $1 million. Uh, this is connected with, with the, the issue of inequality, the, of wealth, because the, the very rich people really tend to buy in the high end of the market. And what is driving up prices, etc., is the ability to pay in that uh, segment. Okay, let me go to... Well, here I will say something when we analyze the, the, the behavior of prices. But you can see that, uh, that in the crisis of 2008 and 9, the, the orange line, orange, uh, brown, uh, went down, uh, the, the, the volume went down sharply in 2009, and then recovered with some ups and downs. And the values are in the, are the blue bars, and also follow more or less the behavior of, of uh, volumes. Uh, that shows that the market tends to be pro-cyclical in the aggregate. I mean, these are the aggregate markets. Perhaps uh, Picasso or Modigliani uh, may not uh, follow the macroeconomic cycles, but the aggregate numbers do follow the, the cycle. Well, this issue of, of, of taxation, uh, regulation of the market, is, I think is very important in this, in this area. Well, free ports, I understand that in uh, Luxembourg there is a very important free port, is used generally uh, there are other free ports in, in, in uh, Geneva, in Singapore. Beijing is open a new uh, uh, free port. But uh, they may be controversial in the sense that, that you station artwork there, wait till the prices go up. And you are in international jurisdiction in terms of taxation, so you, are, you don't pay taxes while you keep the, the artwork there. And you can do private sales and nobody we know about that, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's a tricky area for you just to know. Uh, okay, let me turn. Well, here is the global share of the US market, the UK, China, and then the more traditional markets, France, Switzerland, Germany, Spain, the rest of the world. As you see, the US, particularly New York City, dominates the global uh, art market with 44% of the total sales followed by the, by the British uh, art market, and then China, the thing that I just mentioned. France and Germany and Switzerland I, are behind this uh, number. I don't know Luxembourg, whether it will fit in the, in the, <laughs> the graph, but uh, OK. Well, I will say something here on, on, on the statistics of, of millionaires and the number and wealth and the, the, the amount of wealth that dollar millionaires accumulate uh, in the, since 2010 to 2018, the number is going up. Okay, people with net worth over one million dollar, which is the people that you may think will go to the upper end of the market. Okay, let me let me turn to the second issue of connections between the art market and macroeconomic uh, cycles. And here, uh, the empirical analysis of, of the paper focus on the uh, behavior of art prices. This is an aggregate index in US dollars. Uh, here is the, the global index in US dollars, also the global index in euros, which is a light blue. And then I compare it with the Standard & Poor, or a blue, really, a Standard & Poor 500, and then with gold. I will say something because gold is a very important comparator here if we are looking for safe haven assets. And again, the, 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 there was a boom in the late 1990s, early 2000 in the market, then a recover, uh, some correction and recovery, and then the fall between uh, 2008 the first quarter and 2009 was on the order of 40% in the market for prices in US dollars. And then there is a recovery afterwards. Look at the, the first uh, lines in the, in the picture in dollars. And, and well, here, but probably, I don't know if it can be seen, there is a, there is a classification of, of the period. Uh, 1990, before the crisis of 2008 and 2009, the so-called global financial crisis, 
then the behavior of the prices in the, during the crisis, 2008 and 9, and the recovery afterwards. So the, the uh, global prices in, in euros fell 39.6% between 2008 quarter one and 2009 quarter four, but then they recovered quite strongly in the first three years after the slump by 77%, but then fell again. It's a, it's a quite unstable path of uh, recovery of art prices. If we compare that with the, with the stock prices using the US Standard & Poor, we'll see a different dynamics. Uh, the, the increase in prices before the, the, the 2008 was moderate. I mean, the, 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 the crisis was preceded more by a boom in the real estate market rather than a boom in the stock market. But the, the drop was uh, similar to the drop in art prices, 47%, minus 47%. What is remarkable and what makes it different from the behavior of art prices is the recovery of the last 10 years in the price of uh, stocks. 200% in real terms. All these indices are in real terms deflated by the US CPI index or wholesale price index that can be used to. But nearly 197% the increase. So stocks have overperformed art very by, by, a, by a big, big uh, margin in the 10 years that followed the slam of 2008 and 9. Let me show uh, gold. Gold is a very interesting asset. Nobody cares about buying gold. Uh, when there is no crisis, but when there is a crisis, you tend to regret yourself that you didn't buy a gold. So it's, watch out, gold is very, is very important. Here, what I, I did was to compare three major slams in the global economies uh, uh, in the last 70, 80 years. One is the Great Depression of the 1930s, the other is the uh, stagflation of the 1970s, and the other is the global financial crisis of 2008 and nine. And then I look at uh, the, the real price of uh, gold, number of US dollars you have to pay for uh, an ounce of uh, gold. And then I, I computed the ratio of the, the peak and truth and the percentage change that's it under parentheses. And you see something that is very interesting. Gold has always appreciated in value in, during crisis period. In the 19... 30s, between, uh, if you compute 1929 December with 1934 February, the price of gold went, these are gold in real terms, from $282 to $601 and, and $17, uh, an increase over uh, uh, two, two times, two, a little bit two times. In percentages, you have to the, the, uh, uh, subtract one. So it's 118. Then in the stagflation of the 70s, but before the price even declined, in the roaring 1920s, gold was a very poor investment. If you compare 1926, uh, the, six month, the June of 1920, right after World War I, to 1929 uh, September, before the, the October crash, you will see that the, the price of gold almost didn't increase, very little, over a 10-year period. And then, skyrocket. If you go to the stagflation of the 70s, gold also did very well. Okay, that was the best period for gold. And also, if you go to the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, you will see that there is a, there is a, a run that goes from 2001 and 2011, when the price of gold was steadily going up and up and up. So, uh, this is a, an important uh, finding in terms that uh, we see that art prices and, the, and sales tend to be very procyclical, whereas gold tend to be countercyclical. So if you want to protect your portfolio, you may want, uh, across cycles and crashes, you may want to incorporate uh, gold. The question of the paper is to what extent art can perform the same role of being a uh, portfolio protection asset or an asset that uh, goes uh, against or, or a different correlation, a negative correlation with, let's say, stocks and other assets. 
Here I have, a, well, here let me show before the correlation matrix. This is, a, this is the ratio between gold prices and stock prices uh, over a, almost a century, a little bit. Between 1914 and 2015. And you see here, there's some water, so I have to be careful, that the, the ratio went down before the, the Great Depression in the 1920s, and then the ratio went up. This is the ratio, not, not only the, the, it's the price of gold divided by the price of uh, stocks remain high. And then it went down over a 25-year period, which is the so-called golden age of capitalism between uh, the mid-1940s, late 1940s to the late 60s, okay? Before the stagflation of the 70s. The ratio declined. Then you have the stagflation of the, the 70s here. The ratio goes up and then you have the, the other crisis again. That shows that they go in different directions. Unfortunately, we don't have series, historical series, that long for our prices. That would be very interesting to compare. But uh, this is the behavior. Well, let me show one more piece here, which is a correlation matrix between the, the, the aggregate art price index and various uh, other assets and measures of stocks, Nikkei, uh, Standard & Poor, gold, oil, uh, and then the FTSE for China, uh, the MSCI, which is like 45 uh, stock markets combined, and then bitcoins, a very interesting thing on bitcoins. I didn't have too much time in the paper to connect with, with uh, bitcoins, but I have another paper just on bitcoins that I should... Uh, uh, perhaps relate to this. Uh, well, it shows, I mean, it, it, on, the, on the red bracket, there, there, box, uh, it's a rectangle, uh, the, the, the correlation, simple correlation, between the R price global index and the Nikkei negative, the Standard & Poor negative, gold positive, and uh, oil positive, but, uh, yeah, positive. And then this is the significance level. So in general, this shows that though if you look at the, the graphs, uh, the behavior of gold is different than the behavior of art in the last 20 year cycle that we do have data for art prices. Uh, in general, the, the statistical correlation between gold and art is positive. And since uh, gold is a counter cyclical, a safe haven asset, this somebody could infer that art could become also an asset with that sort of uh, property. Well, let me, let me turn to inequality because at, at the end we are in a, in a seminar on inequality and something, so uh, uh, to stick to the, to the seminar. Uh, well, I think more research is needed in this area, clearly, and well, I know that at the university, uh, Conchita is leading uh, efforts in that direction here, perhaps at the bank, I don't know. Uh, well, the, the story is relatively well known. We know that, that uh, wealth inequality has increased both at the country level for main economies and also at global level. Here is a series of the uh, wealth share of the top 1%, the richest 1% in five main economies, China, France, Russia, UK, US. And what you see is an increase in, in, uh, in the share starting more or less in the 1980s with globalization, with, uh, economic, uh, with free market economics, with neoliberal policies, etc. And particularly sharp is the turn to, to, to inequality in, uh, in Russia. Okay, this is the formation of the oligarchs after the... The, the, the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, in China also, uh, there has been a very important increase in wealth inequality, and that's why probably the Chinese art market is booming. Uh, and then more, uh, and the US, I think the three, the three largest increases in, in wealth inequality at the top, the concentration at the top, are the US, Russia, and China. More moderate, the increase in inequality have been in, uh, in France and uh, the UK. Well, I already showed this, this graph. 
And here we have uh, the global share of millionaires in excess of $50 million. Uh, again, the US and China is where most of the money gets concentrated, okay? 47% in the US, the top art market, then followed by China, the second or third top uh, art market. Well, I think I should stop here and perhaps we can open the, the, the floor for, for questions and, and answers. I think this is an important, an important market. I mean, the, the volumes are high. I mean, 60, the market that trades $65 uh, billion is not a small market. It's not the largest market, smaller than the stock market, of course, smaller than the property market, uh, it's below still than gold and silver. Uh, but it's a very relevant market. And also, perhaps more importantly, it's a barometer of two important trends, economic volatility, macroeconomic volatility, and wealth inequality. So you can read these two global trends through their working in this uh, market.